Hello, I'm Ryan Olson with the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia, where I serve as the director. I'm joined today by Garnett Cadigan, who in 2017-18 was a Martin Luther King Jr. scholar at MIT. He is a visiting scholar at the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University. He's a member of our institute's Council Trust, and for four years he's been a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture. Garnett, welcome. Thank you. You are hard at work on a book project. Tell us about that. I'm working on a book on walking, asking what does it mean to think about public space and vulnerability and community by way of this simple commonplace act, this thing that we take for granted, but is rich with meaning. It speaks about the ways in which we encounter others, the ways in which we escape, the ways in which we move through the world. And by looking at walking, by looking at how we engage with our community, the way we encounter those we know and don't know, the ways in which we, and the pace at which we move through the world. What might that tell us about cities? What might that tell us about interaction? What might that tell us about the ways in which we see and understand and interact with each other? So in some ways it's about walking, but in most ways it's not. It's really about how do we encounter and engage with the world. And what are you finding so far? as you think about what does walking uh, tell us? It's a barometer. The way in which if it's raining outside, we're wet. If there's garbage all over the sidewalk, a stink smell assaults us. And socially, it's not much different. That it tells us a lot about vulnerability. What does it mean to move to the world as someone who is, for instance, disabled? You know, how is the world if that's the way we're moving through with that vulnerability? in anchoring us, or rather in directing the vector with which we move. What if, for instance, we're injured or aged? Or what if we're moving through cities in which we're alone and feel disconnected? And what might walk and tell us about the way a city embraces you or keeps you at bay? What might it mean if you're an immigrant, for instance, moving through, you know, how in the ways the city welcomes you, keeps you at bay, raises questions about you know, who you are, or invites you to be a part of it. You know, how might all these things, you know, discovered step by step on foot, tell you something about a place? And so I'm discovering as I go through that this thing that is so often overlooked or taken for granted, it becomes a wonderfully powerful tool in explaining about cities, explaining about public spaces. It also becomes a way to look at changes, the ways in which we've now been confined to cars. The automobile has become king. And the pace at which we move through places, the ways in which we move past, but not really encounter each other. A lot of that has been determined by the automobile and the predominance of the automobile. It says something also about the ways in which we're giving ourselves over to things like equations and algorithms, the ways in which our tastes and our interests are so often directed and the ways in which these devices you know, have become things to think for us, to move us in these directions. And so we're removing more and more opportunities for serendipity and spontaneity and with that community from our lives. So in looking at walking, something that initially I began pursuing to ask, what does it mean to coexist in public space? I'm discovering a whole panoply of other things, you know, issues having to do with visibility, to do with vulnerability, to do with engagement, to do with community, to do with any number of human endeavors and limitations and possibilities. So why walking? How did you get interested in walking? Part of it started from just habit, my own childhood habit of walking and being someone who encountered and met the world on my feet and so my own interests, my own habits led to a particular intellectual curiosity and as I began exploring I saw just the worlds that were hidden beneath the feet and I thought also there are so many things we would like to discuss and talk about that we can't because people are so embattled, people have 
retreated to their own corners and decided that a conversation can't be had. And so there's a need all the more so now to find common acts or find places of you know, common inquiry. And walking seems to be one of those things. It seems almost so simple that it's beneath our consideration. But as you begin to look closely, this thing that so many people love doing is a way in which people escape, get away from their thoughts, or sometimes the way in which they run to those thoughts. We walk to think, we walk sometimes to stop thinking. And to look at this, that is this pleasurable act for so many. Some people do it for exercise, some people do it for relaxation. You know, you know many people do it for even romance. You're walking with someone that you're attracted to and it becomes a way to move through it, that slow pace, that measured pace and get to know the person. That what might it mean to look at this and to ask some of the tougher questions that we often retreat from or we feel that there is no common ground with which to think about it. And what about this act that it's such a common act that short of a disability or injury, almost all of us participate in it. You wrote a famous essay called Walking While Black. What is that essay about? It asks, what might it mean to go through the world in which your movements are directed or sometimes too often hemmed in by thoughts about your vulnerability? What might it mean to have the different joys of walking, serendipity, encounter, constricted or denied because of the color of your skin. And it becomes a way to look at this long tradition of walkers who've walked and given themselves over to the city, to explore the city, to inhale the city, but to show the ways in which that very joy and the serendipities that come with it are limited if, for instance, you're of dark complexion. And then to ask the question, what might it mean to think of a city, a place that's thought of as a place of arrival, you know, somewhere where we go to find ourselves or you know, lose ourselves and lose ourselves in the experience of interacting with others? What if that interaction is fraught with fear? What might it mean to move through the world where fear too often directs our movements rather than the joy of encounter. And so it becomes a way to ask questions about the ways in which we move in public space and the things that direct that, the things that limit it. And to ask what does it mean to truly arrive in a social sense? What does it mean to truly arrive in a space where others are around you? And what does it mean to have that arrival kept at bay because you're at fear, in a, you're, you fear other people's fear of you? How is your work on the city and some of these other topics that you're touching on different from uh, what's already available? The ways in which it's different is I'm asking what might it mean to enter the city through the avenues that we often take for granted, that we often zoom past? What might it mean to slow down and to enter the city as a place filled with mystery. That the city for me is not something to master as much as it's a thing filled with mysteries and to give yourself over to those mysteries. And so what I think may make my work different from others is how much mystery is the vector with which I move along through the city rather than a desire for mastery and my suspicion of mastery in the city. But also along with that is my sense that the city is a place of deep conjunctions. Conjunctions and intersections would happen only from moving at a very slow pace, the kind of pace afforded to you by moving on your feet step by step, or moving in at a walker's pace if you're not even walking. And so what makes my approach different is this insistence on subjectivity and a subjectivity which gives itself over to encountering others and encountering other subjectivities 
and seeing the opportunities and the possibilities that come from that. But also, along with that, is a sense that the city is a place with so many things hidden in plain sight. That it's an insistence, and it doesn't make my work distinctive so much as it's, it accords with other work, but I may hold it more centrally than a lot of people studying the city, is that I'm interested in blind spots. And the city is a place in which there's a constant moving of blind spots, you know, you know, blind spots moving past each other. And so my desire to uncover these blind spots and to ask, what might it mean to discover our blind spots? And how in discovering these blind spots, we suddenly see things anew, see things afresh. And in so doing, better understand ourselves, understand those around us, understand the city. And it's therefore a desire to see the city less from a bird's eye view and more from, I guess, a snail's pace, um, you know, with a snail's view of moving through quite slowly, um, almost like a sloth and taking our time and looking around and asking what's around us and what does all of this mean? What lessons does your work offer for leaders, for civic leaders, political leaders, business leaders, philanthropic leaders? If it offers any lessons at all, there's, there's a danger in thinking that the work offers lessons that often you work in silence and you put your work in the world and hope that it's not met with silence. And even when it's embraced, I'm reluctant to say it offers lessons, but if it does offer anything, it's, it speaks to the importance of listening closely, of listening up close, of recognizing how many things that we take for granted are of utmost importance and how in often trying to see the world from up on high that we miss a lot of important details. So if anything, it invites a way of meeting the world that would take you from a boardroom or take you from in front of a spreadsheet or take you away from a powerful algorithm, all of which are important, yes, but to take you down at sidewalk level to encounter and interact with and listen to and observe and give yourself over to the complexity and joy and frustration and serendipity of the people you know, you know, all around you. So what it does, the lesson it does offer is to move very close to the very things that you're concerned about and to give yourselves over to them in observation and in patient, patient listening. That's fascinating. Garnett, thank you. Thank you.